Deuteronomy chapter 3 and genocide and giants. I was saying if you feel like you're just kind of being thrown into the water with it, then, um, well, last week we introduced the idea because there's always questions about uh, genocide. Like how could a loving God command the execution of an entire people, you know, a nation and so forth. And, well, believe it or not, if you really study the Scripture, it ties in giants with genocide and basically an, an, a breeding of genetics between divine beings and human and creating a race that is separate than man and God commands genocide amongst these peoples that were involved with that. Yes, some of them would just simply be human. Many of these people were. But then also uh, amidst them, these Nephilim or Rephaim, Anakim, Zamzumim, Emim, different names because of the different languages that are all around there and the different groups. So, yeah, it's, it's sort of a, a big topic. And it is, uh, it is in the Scriptures. So... It's at Deuteron- We're going through the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 2 deals with it. Numbers 13, Numbers 21 deal with it. Genesis chapter 6 deals with it. First Peter and Jude talk about these things. Um, it's through the Scriptures. So in Deuteronomy chapter 3 continues talking about it. So we're going to pick up part 2 of this topic. And it's the record of Israel taking out the Amorites. The first king of the Amorites was Sihon, King Sihon, and we talked about him last week. <clears throat> and now the second king of the Amorites is King Og, O-G, of the, uh, he's of the kingdom of Bashan. And there's a lot uh, to glean in here, and our desire will be to learn about the past, but glory in Jesus and the victory that he has accomplished and the plans he has for the future for us, right? So we're going to learn about some of these things, but God has a plan of, of redemption through our Savior Jesus. And, and it's very involved with the Lord when we re- read the Old Testament in these texts. So let's look at the text. Let's talk about these giants again, and let's look at the bigger picture of how God, through Jesus Christ, is redeeming the rule of the nations, I mean, we're reading about that in Psalm 9. We're reading about that in Psalm 10, in Psalm chapter 2. Through a lot of the Psalms, you'll read about that. You'll read about uh, that in Philippians, where God is going to have rule over the nations, uh, where, where the temptation in, in the uh, wilderness, where the nations were offered to Jesus, and he denied that shortcut, right? So it's, it's all over the Bible, this, this kingdom warfare over the world. And so... Uh, his church is going to be a part of that. We are a part of that. So let's pray and then enter into Deuteronomy chapter 3. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we do pray that you'd sanctify it to our hearts this morning. May our, our minds be open, our hearts be open, if anything's not according to truth, and just uh, reveal that to us. And we pray for the leading of your Holy Spirit, the gifts we pray for. Um, just a protection upon us and a guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. Deuteronomy 3, verse 1, Then we turned and went up the road to Bashan. And Og, king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edrai. And the Lord said to me, Do not fear him, for I have delivered him and all his people and his land into your hand, You shall do to him as you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt at Heshbon. So the Lord is encouraging them. He's promising victory over Og's kingdom, just like he gave them victory over Sihon in south uh, of the area of the Amorites. Now they're facing those in the north for the Amorite kingdom. Okay, and... Just as before, so it's going to be after. And you'll see that at the end of the, of the chapter as well, where God's promising, look, I've done it before for you. I'm going to do it again for you. He's so faithful. Verse 3, so the Lord our God also delivered into our hands Og, king of Bashan, with all his people, and we attacked him until he had no survivors remaining. And we took all his cities, all that time, or sorry, at that time, there was not a city which we did not take from them, 60 cities. All the region of Argob, 
the kingdom of Og and Bashan. All these cities were fortified with high walls, gates, and bars, besides a great many rural towns. And we utterly destroyed them, as we did to Sihon, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying the men, women, and children of every city. By the way, that utter destruction is harem, K-H-E-R-E-M, or K-H-A-R-A-M, harem, utter destruction. Uh, We talked about that last week as well, and a little more of this one. Verse 7, but all the livestock and the spoil of the cities, we took as booty for ourselves. So they did overtake uh, them, and just as God had promised, I'm going to, they took Sihon, now they took over Og in the north, and it was an utter destruction, harem, just, it was, it was just capital punishment, it was not genocide, it was not cruel and tyrannical, it was just, and it was righteous, and it was governed by the, by the very character of God, and it was past due. You know, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Genesis uh, 15, I believe. It's not yet to the full. Well, it's become to the full over 400 years later. And then another 40 years because that previous generation wouldn't do it. And they backed down from God's command, went back to the wilderness, wandered around the book of Numbers, and then came back up. And so it's beyond due, this, this um, execution of judgment upon this wicked, wicked peoples. So... Uh, that's last week. If you want to hear more about that, you're able to online. And, and this, how is this capital punishment and not genocide? So the Lord said, though, don't fear him. Just like you defeated Sihon, you'll defeat the kingdom of Og and Bashan. Bashan. And Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary says, Og's gigantic appearance and the formidable array of his forces he will bring to the Field need not discourage you, for belonging to a doomed race, he is destined to share the fate of Sihon. And so this, this was a war of extermination, extermination that went on with these people. And again, don't touch the uh, Moabites, don't touch the Ammonites, don't touch the Edomites, and utterly destroy the Amorites. There's a big difference there, big difference. So verse 8 in chapter 3 continues, And at that time we took the land from the hand of the two kings of the Amorites who were on this side of the Jordan from the river Arnon to Mount Hermon. That's the, the location, the river Arnon. Remember, that's where they entered all the way up to Mount Hermon. Now that's where Og's territory was. The Sidonians call Hermon Syrian, and the Amorites call it Sinir. Verse 10, all the cities of the plain, all Gilead and all Bashan, as far as Salca and Edrai, the cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan. So this is covering some of the geography, and I want to talk with you about that. That they took basically the land east of the Jordan River, going from the Dead Sea area up through Galilee and to the north of the Galilee, all on the eastern side of the Jordan River, okay? Not Judah and then north and Samaria, but the eastern side of the Jordan River. This is the territory that they have taken from the river Arnon in the south by the Dead Sea up to Mount Hermon in the north. And Hermon is a mountain chain. And so it says there in verse 9, it's talking about these different names because if you look at a mountain chain from different sides, you're going to have different names for it. You know, different tribes, different peoples and languages are going to look at that. But Hermon was the tallest of those mountains in that chain. So often it's called the mountains of Hermon or Mount Hermon or however you want to say it. And it's the tallest one with that remains snow-capped throughout the uh, seasons. And Mount Hermon has a real significance. In Jewish literature, not knowing if this is fact or not, but it's just... Jewish literature during the times of uh, the Second Temple and during the silent years between the Testaments and so forth. Mount Hermon was said to be the location of the rebellion where the divine beings had intercourse with the daughters of men, Genesis 6, 1 to 5 or 1 to 4. In their day, this was the land of the, the two kings that we're talking about here. In other words, Jewish literature says that's where that went on. Mount Hermon is where that took place, okay? Or that divine rebellion. But then you think, well, there was a global flood. Then would have Hermon existed before and after? At least a flood in that territory, new mountains. I don't know. I don't know about that. But at least that's in the mindset of Jews as they're writing the scriptures and so forth. At least that's in the mindset in Jesus' day of the people who lived there. This is where that happened, okay? 
At least that's there, the idea of it. And uh, in their day, this, this was that land of these two formidable kings. These were kings to be absolutely feared. And so when they go and enter the land, everybody's like, whoa, we know, we heard about what happened in Egypt, but also what's happened on the east of the Jordan with the, the kings of the Amorites. And they're not losing anybody to, in this war. You know, their losses are none, and here they're destroying them all. They have got total victory going on. It's just inc- incredible. And God's delivering them into their hand. And so um, these divine powers weren't shy about keeping, uh, keeping this area unknown. They, 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 they are, sorry, keeping it known for its evil. They, they didn't mind that this area was known as the evil place, okay? They, they continued to that day at least, during the day of Joshua, that King Og and King Sihon were involved in great wickedness. It was well known. Just put it there. And that, by the way, will continue to the days of Jesus, Matthew 16 and 17, and we're going to try to get through the text and look at that at the end of this message, Matthew 16 and 17. So this area, Bashan, and then it says the Edrei, E-D-R-E-I, I don't know how it's pronounced, and also Ashtoreth uh, was a city there as well, Edrei and Ashtoreth being cities in the area, the large kingdom area being called Bashan. It's an area, okay, like a province or something like that. And Bashan itself has, what, 60 cities in it? Countless rural towns. The cities are larger. They ha- all the cities have walls. All the cities are fortified. They have bronze gate bars at them. And Og dwelt at both Edrai and Ashtaroth. That's in the scriptures. Bashan, this area. It's physically known as a, it's a mountainous area. It's got great pastures. It's known for its uh, valleys. Because think about it. In a desert, you've got mountains. You've got snow melt. You've got water. And so it's got great valleys, great pastures, great uh, vegetation going on. And so it's great for its cattle. It's known for its abundance of cattle. Bashan and cattle are going to be paired together throughout the scriptures. It's spiritually, though, known as this epicenter of unholiness and occultic, satanic, spiritualistic wickedness. Bashan was a fertile area for, obviously, the cattle, the beef, and all sorts. But, metaphorically, the cattle of Bashan become ideas of, of wickedness. Okay? So, what do you mean? Well, if you look at Psalm 22, you know Psalm 22 probably. It foretells Jesus dying on the cross. My bones are out of joint, heart like wax. Well, all of a sudden, right in the middle of it, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he says, strong bulls of Bashan, many bulls of Bashan have surrounded me, right? They've encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like raging, roaring lion. Then he goes on, my, I'm poured out like water. My bones are all out of joint. My heart's like wax melted within me. So, really? Bulls were surrounding him? No, bulls weren't surrounding him. Oh, the Romans were surrounding him. No, yeah, some Romans were around there. The Jews were around there. Well, maybe it's like what C.S. Lewis envisioned in his Chronicles of Narnia, where it's a host of wicked, demonic entities surrounding Aslan as he's being slain at the stone table, and they're pulling it out, and they're just glorying and gloating over the pain they're inflicting upon our Savior. Don't you think they were around maybe too, these strong bulls of Bashan? So this imagery is being portrayed in Psalm 22. It's it's happening there. And uh, did the devil not think he was getting a victory at the time Jesus was being crucified? What do you think? I think he thought he was getting a victory when Christ is being crucified. All right, let's do it. And there's text to back that up in the New Testament that I can show you in a bit. Psalm 68, okay, for sake of time, I'm not going to go into it. I would like to spend a whole Sunday talking about Psalm 68. I read it in the three different translations last night, uh, just further into studies, and it just blows me away. It's calling Mount Hermon the Mount Bashan. It's calling Mount Hermon Mount Bashan, mountains of Bashan, Bashan. And it's saying in Psalm 68, this is God's mount, mountain now. From all the way from Sinai to Mount Bashan, Mount Hermon, it all belongs to God. And then big, it says God's going to bring thousands upon thousands of his chariots there. 
And, he's, and, and then it says, he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts to men. Now, that is a popular verse that we read about. He ascended on high, led captivity captive. That's about the resurrection. It's about a little more than that, probably. He ascended on high, led captivity captive, and gave gifts to men. Is that he destroyed the pinnacle of these wicked beings and led people free and gave gifts to men and put these spirits in prison and so forth. Like it, in other words, it has to do more with his crucifixion and resurrection and the gifts of his spirit and so forth. But it is about the gift of his spirit to us. What victory he's given us over any uh, offense that would come against us, right? Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, right? So that's what that's talking about. But basically, let me just tell you this. Psalm 68 is absolutely full of offensive language. Toward every pagan in the territory, everybody that knows of the false gods, if they heard Psalm 68, they're going to be like, that's hate speech. Uh, you know, that's so offensive. They're going to be shaking in their boots, or they're going to be looking at that going, no, we can't have, uh, have that book, have that chapter around, or something like that, you know, because it's, it's so full of in-your-face uh, affront, and it's God writing it, and it really, he's, for lack of better terms, putting the smack down on the divine rebellion and evil powers and kingdoms in Psalm 68. It's full of that talk. It's a slap in the face toward these guys. And it's not just Psalm 68. It's in other places in the Bible as well. When you look at repetitive words back in uh, chapter 3 of Deuteronomy, in four times it's going to say Og, king of Bashan, or the kingdom of Og and Bashan in verse 1, 3, 4, 10. And you're going to read it three more times before the, the short chapter ends, verse 11, verse 13, verse 14. Because what's going on here? See, these names will ring out in the Jewish mind for generations as something supremely evil, something very wicked, and that have a spiritual significance to them. And what is my point? Well, the point is that these terms are loaded with spiritual significance. Okay, so we just read it. Mm, Okay, next chapter. Mm, oh, I get that part. He's going to give us a new heart. I love that part. It's great. I can't wait to chapter four. But when we, when we read through it like that, we don't realize that in the Jewish mindset when they read it, it's loaded, okay? It's heavy. They're going, whoa, he's going to do what to where? Put it this way, like, like anyone not from Victoria doesn't know the meaning of, of you know, Johnson Street or Pandora, some of these areas. But if you're from Victoria and go downtown, you know some of the meaning, right? You know where the bad spots are. You know where some of the dirt is. You know uh, where things are. It's like, but they, they had that idea, and yet we read through it, and we don't get it. We'll miss that, okay? So uh, let's take a look at this, this King Og and return to verse 11. And we'll stop here for quite a while. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Indeed, his bedstead was an iron of bedstead, an iron bedstead. Is it not in Rabbah of the people of Ammon? So that's written there after the war, of course, this was written. Nine cubits is its length and four cubits its width according to the standard cubit. So Og was according to this, the only one remaining of the giants are literally the Rephaim, the Rephaim, the different families of these, of these giants coming from Anak maybe, not sure, but he's obviously not the last of those who have the giant DNA in them because either he's the last one living on the east side of the Jordan, but if obviously you're going to have Goliath and his brothers and you're going to have others on the west side, and so forth. But maybe he's the last one of that particular clan or type. I don't know. But it says, behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. And, of course, beds were common, right, in that day because, well, for for those who had wealth, you would obviously have mattresses on the floor or whatever. But bugs, especially in the heat, in the desert, you're going to have bugs, and they're going to climb. So you make a bedstead. You raise the bed off the ground. 
Like, we don't even know why we do it anymore. It's like, well, that's why they did it. Oh, okay, that makes sense. They had bugs, and so they'd raise it up off the ground. And there are ancient bedsteads, okay? And um, they had to go to Bed Bath & Beyond and get them, and then uh, Capital Iron and get it to go together. I don't know. But they would have them, of course, of iron and metal. Why? Because that's impervious to the pests, all right? And concerning the size of this, though, a cubit is about half a yard, and the bedstead of Og would measure 13 and a half feet. So they estimate Og, okay, so if his bed had to be that big, maybe he's 11, maybe he's 12 feet big, or maybe they just caused his bed to be much larger than he was. It doesn't say how tall or big Og was. It just says how big his bed was, right? And there are documents of people that would make giant beds to impress other people or something like that, but maybe that's the case. The dimensions, though, like biblically, we, they, they don't necessarily tell us the size of this man, only that he would have to be smaller than the nine by four cubit bed, right? Really. But his bedstead, it does say here, was kept somewhere in Ammon, which they weren't to touch Ammon, the distance of Lot, south of the Amorite kingdom, south of the Dead Sea on the eastern side. They weren't to touch, they weren't, they, it was kept in Ammon as like this relic or something. And why does he even say this in, in Rabbah, like at the, at the giant bedstead museum or something? What is it doing there? But it was obviously well known. Obviously, the writers of the Bible even knew that King Og's bedstead was kept in Rabbah. I was like, what is going on there? Well, maybe there's more that meets the eye to this bed. It's, it's got a significance to it that we don't understand. So, that's not a picture of it. I've never seen it before. That is just a tag off the internet there that you're looking at. The ancient Israelite reading this passage, again, thinks differently of it than we do in, in a few ways. Several things are going to stand out. To us, again, it's a flyby. But check this out. The dimensions 9 by 4 cubits or 13 and a half by 6 feet are precisely, exactly the dimensions of the cultic bed in the ziggurat called Etemenanki. And that is the ziggurat that almost all archaeologists identify as the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. The Tower of Babel. In other words... There's a bed the exact same size from the Tower of Babel at Etemenanki, which the ruins of it are there today. Now, I always thought, as a kid for some reason, I always thought God put his thumb and he smashed the Tower of Babel down, like, like my brothers would break my block towers down. And no, that's never in the text. He gave them languages and dispersed them. It doesn't say he destroyed the tower. So nevertheless, the ruins of this are here, and people do believe, all the scholars believe, it's, where is it, by the way? Babylon in Iraq, a different name, New Umami, or it's a sub, sub uh, sedary of Babylon, but that's where this uh, ziggurat, Etemenanki, is. And ziggurats function as temples in divine abodes. Here's some slides of what uh, they would assume it looked like, except for the bottom right one is a real slide of some soldiers climbing the ziggurat, and you can kind of get an idea of how big the base of it is when you look at that one. But there's some pictures of what it would look like. Now look at the little uh, house on the top of it there. The unusually large bed at, at Timonaki, and I'm, I'm quoting from a book here, and it says, was housed in the house of the bed. It was a place where the god Marduk and his divine wife Zarpanity met annually for ritual lovemaking, the purpose of which was divine blessing upon the land. The ritual was also concerned with maintaining the cosmic order instituted by the gods. The link between God, or between Og, now Og, what we're talking about in Deuteronomy 3, and Marduk, ancient Babylon, may telegraph the idea that Og was the inheritor and perpetuator of the Babylonian knowledge and cosmic order from before the flood. So, in other words, a message may have be, be being sent here. Why, why are they, wow, the Bible's got great detail. It does have great detail. Why are they talking about this bed? Well, it may be sending the message. Again, this kingdom of Og and Bashan links right back to Babylon and Marduk and the God there and what they were doing there. Hmm. 
Okay. Links them back again to Nephilim of Genesis 6, 1 to 4, which, by the way, says there were giants in those days and also afterwards. Also afterwards. So the point is that there's more at play than just Og's dimensions here. The bedstead itself is talked about in the Bible, probably because there's this connection of a spiritual significance that we're talking about here. Now, I, I think the terms used all over the text support this. Okay, so there's the term Rephaim that we've been looking at. The term Rephaim is connected to the giant Anakims and other clans we read about last chapter, Amims, they call them Zuma memes, and so forth and so forth. And the Rephaim are also in other ancient literature texts. In other words, it's not just the Bible that talks about this stuff, okay? Well, it's just the Bible, it's just this fairy tale. Other ancient literature texts record the same stuff especially in all of this area. It records the same stuff, okay? So, and what are the Rephaim referred to in other ancient literature texts? Quasi-divine dead warrior kings who inhabit the underworld. Quasi-divine dead warrior kings who inhabit the underworld. That's where they're at now. Hmm, okay. And Bashan means serpent, Surprise. So it means place of the serpent. And the Nakash, or the serpent, became lord of the dead after his rebellion in Eden. So King Og now is a Rephaim, or this quasi-divine being, ruling in Bashan, the kingdom of the serpent. And he had the bed that was the precise dimensions of the ritual bed for the god Marduk from the Tower of Babel. Okay. You're like, what is going on here? Well, let's just talk about it a little more. Joshua 12, 4 to 5. Looks back on the battle with Og and refers to him as the king of Bashan and living at these two places, Ashtoreth and Edrai. And it says, Og, king of Bashan, one of the remnant of the Rephaim, who lived at Ashtoreth and at Edrai and ruled over Mount Hermon. So these terms and places, Ashtoreth, Edrai, Bashan, they are, again, theologically loaded terms for an Israelite and all of the neighbors who lived at that time and those coming after. Really, I don't have a first century Jewish mind inside of me. I've got a 20th century, you know, going to the 21st century uh, mindset of a guy who grew up with Generation X. Like, I'm way removed, in other words, from, from that mindset, right? Right? And so we've got, no, we want it all to be clean. We don't want to think about supernatural things. We don't even want to think about lesser divine beings that are under the rule of the one and true only God. I only like the idea that there's one God and not anything lesser. Oh, yeah, there's Satan. Okay, uh, that's clear. But there's nobody else kind of thing. Well, Satan's got buddies. Let's just put it that way. That's all it's talking about. He's got buddies. There's more than just Satan. Satan. And they've got a degree of authority and power to them. Okay? That's, that's really it. So it's, it's not, that, um, not that much to freak out about, really. But we can only imagine what it meant for them. You know? These locations, by the way, Ashroth, Edrai, they're understood as the gateway to the realm of the dead. That's the realm of the underworld. That's what they're understood as. Even Matthew 16 says that. Even Jesus, when he takes them there, tells them that. Okay? Same place. That's where he takes them, the foot of Mount Hermon. But we would start to get that idea when we read this text for sure. Mount Hermon, another, another name here. It's a noun with the same root as the verb that's important to what we're talking about here, harem. Hermon, harem. Okay? It's just there. And we shared about that last week, the distinct verb of holy war to devote to total destruction, uh, that verb of extermination. So uh, let's go ahead and look at the text here, continuing in chapter 3. This land and this land which we possess at that time from Aror, which is by River Arnon, and half the mountains of Gilead and its cities I have, or I gave to the Reubenites and the Gadites. The rest of Gilead and all Bashan, the kingdom of Og, I gave to half the tribe of Manasseh. All the region of Argob with all Bashan was called the land of the giants, the land of the Rephaim, okay? 
Jer, the son of Manasseh. Oh, sorry, let me pause there for a second. By the way, throughout the Bible, even in King David's day and otherwise, there's also a place called the Valley of the Rephaim. There's over 10 references through the Bible of the Valley of the Rephaim. It's this location. Now, it's not the same location we're talking about here, actually. And that Valley of Rephaim adjoined the Valley of Hinnom. Hinnom became the new Greek word for Gehenna, Hades, hell. And the Valley of Hinnom was where a lot of the wicked kings, even kings of Israel, would be doing the child sacrifice and so forth like that. A very uh, sick place. Nevertheless, anyway, so this was, though, known as the land of the giants in verse 13. Verse 14, Jair, the son of Manasseh, took all the region of Argob as far as the border of the Geshurites and the Machathites and called Bashan after his own name, Haveth Jair, to this day. Also, I gave Gilead to Machir and to the Reubenites and the Gadites I gave from Gilead as far as the river Arnon, the middle of the river at, as the border, as far as the river Jabbok, the border of the people of Ammon, the plain also with the Jordan as the border from Chinnereth as far as the east side of the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, below the slopes of Pisgah. So, in other words, Chinnereth is Galilee. Chinnereth is Lake, the Sea of Galilee, Lake Galilee, okay? Where Jesus fed the multitude and the disciples went fishing and so forth uh, by Nazareth. Chinnereth is Galilee, Arabah would be the Salt Sea. And it's funny, it tells us that they renamed Bashan. It says, we renamed it. And it's known as some other name, Habeth Jair, to this day. But yet, move for, fast forward to King David's day, and they're still referencing Bashan. That idea is stuck around. They couldn't get rid of the idea. It's like, rename Las Vegas. Right? Oh, well, let's rename it. Let's rename it City in the, in the Desert, or something else. Right? Just Whatever. And, and people are going to still be like Vegas, Vegas. V that you, you're not going to get rid of that name, right? It's stuck. And Bashan, that identity stuck for a long time, even though they renamed it. So down in uh, verse 18, Then I commanded you at that time, saying, The Lord your God has given you this land to possess all you men of valor shall cross over arm before your brethren, the children of Israel, but your wives, your little ones, and your livestock. I know that you have much livestock shall stay in your cities when I, which I've given you. But Lord, I have so much livestock. I know you've got a lot of livestock. You still need to go fight with your brothers. Verse 20, until the Lord has given rest to your brethren as to you, and they also possess the land which the Lord your God is giving them beyond the Jordan, then each of you may return to his possession, which I have given you. And I commanded Joshua at the time, saying, your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. So will the Lord do to all the kingdoms through which you pass. You must not fear them, for the Lord your God himself fights for you. That's a great verse, highlighting it for personal applications. The Lord your God fights for you. But these men of the tribes that were going to stay on the east of the Jordan needed to go fight with their brethren across the Jordan, right? And you've seen what the Lord did to these two kings. Verse 21, you've seen it. Your eyes have seen it. Was it a miracle? Yes, God sent the fear of you before you even went there. He put the fear of you in their hearts. God prepared the way. And was it a miracle what God did? Absolutely. And God is going to do that over there too in your future. Now what God has done for you, he'll continue to do. Have you seen God be gracious in your past? Yes. And is God going to continue to be gracious? Have you seen God provide for you where we tend to get fearful, we tend to get anxious, we tend to get worried? Yeah. And then I tend to get afraid or something. No, God's going to continue to provide for you. He's going to continue to provide for you. And, and we think, Lord, you're so good. All the victories you've given me in the past, they're, they're mine still in the future in that sense. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we rest upon what he has done for us. We don't do it because he's already done it. He's accomplished it, and he'll continue to accomplish it, and he'll carry us all the way through. So there's great applications in that. In verse 22, that admonishment, don't fear. I'll take care of it like I have before. He fights for you. Personally, he fights for me. And why would he fight for me? You know, I, I think about my wife, and I think about my kids. I think about, boy, if they're in danger, I'm going to fight for them. But even, the, even beyond that, every day I fight for them, right? 
and, and as a husband and father. And I would fight for you. I'd fight for all those that, are, that we call one another brother and sister in the church. And how much more Jesus? He fights for us. Why? Because we're in his heart. Just as my family's in my heart. You're in my heart. We're in the heart of Jesus. He loves us. You better bet he'll fight for you. He would lay down his life for you. How will he not also freely give you all things that you need? All things. He will fight for you. And that's such a comfort. That's such a strengthening encouragement to the heart. When we're feeling weak, when we're feeling like we're alone or any of these other things, that our God fights for us. I mean, who would you want on your side? The Lord. And when he's on your side, what can you fear? He is more powerful, of course, than anything, anyone. And he's for you. He's not against you, and he's going to fight. He's actually going to fight for you. Boy, if his hand is strong, how much more his whole arm, right? The real struggle, though, with us, I think, can be putting faith in his word, just like they would have that struggle. They'd have to have the struggle of, okay, I need to put faith in, in the word he's given me, and I need to move forward. Now, once they were in the battle, they saw that great fi- victory, but now they've got to do it again. They've got to cross the Jordan and do it again. All right, Lord, you know? And so that's, that's where the battle kind of lies there, is, is in believing his word and then acting it out and living in that knowledge that he has for us. Why am I still anxious? Why am I still whatever, you know? Well, he fights for me. So let's move on verse 23 here. Then I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? Imagine all that Moses has seen. You've begun to show. Begun? You parted the Red Sea. He destroyed the greatest Egyptian, that army. He did so much. He plagued them. Lord, you've just begun to show me your mighty hand and your works. And, and now he's seeing it still with this next generation and the provision in the wilderness and all that Moses has seen. Who, there's no one in heaven or earth. There's, what God, he says, by the way, is, is there in heaven or on earth who could do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? There is none. Verse 25, and I pray, let me cross over and see the good land before the Jordan, those pleasant mountains in Lebanon. He wants to go on vacation. He wants to see the, the land there. No, verse 26. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough of that. Speak no more to me of this matter. Moses just kept bringing it before the Lord. Like, come on, I want to go. No, I've given you your consequence. You can't go, Moses. And Moses brings it up. He's already brought it up in Deuteronomy. He's going to bring it up again already in chapter 3. And he'll bring it up again. And he's like, I really want to go. And he's, God's like, enough of that. Speak no more on this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah. And lift your eyes toward the west, the north. By the way, when he's standing at Pisgah and he looks north, you know what he's going to see? Mount Hermon. He's going to see Mount Hermon. If he's on the top of Pisgah, the tallest mountain south in that area, he's going to look north over the, the valley in the land of the Amorites. On the north side, he's going to see Hermon. Okay? So look north, look south, look east. Behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan, but command Joshua the, and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which you see. So he stayed in the valley opposite Beth Peor. So, you know, he wants to see those promises fulfilled. He wants to see the fruit of them. He wants to see them so badly. But look at the type. The, the, there's, there's prophetic that uh, is, is, is spelled out for you and spoken, and there's prophetic that's unspoken. What's a prophetic that's unspoken in the Bible? Typology. Uh, the ark, Noah's ark, is, is prophetic, the ark itself. But it's, it, it's not spoken pr- prophetic, like, thus the Lord will do, spoken, okay? And there's unspoken types in people, too like how John the Baptist is that Elijah or something like that. Well, here's one right here, Moses himself. Moses himself became a type uh, uh, and, and prophetic. In John chapter 1, verse 17, it says, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So Moses couldn't enter the land, and that is prophetic in the sense that the law doesn't bring you into the land. The law doesn't bring you into the promises of God. 
the law and legalism and good works and all those things don't bring you into God's favor and his blessing. They don't give you more acceptance than the next guy. And Moses could look on a distance and you can get a vantage point from the law of the character of God and the desire of God for humanity and so forth. But it doesn't bring you in. Only through Joshua, his name is literally Yeshua, only through Jesus do you enter in. The type is very clear. And Jesus goes before us. And I I love what it says about Joshua in verse 28. Command Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him. Hey, in, in Christ, when I am walking in Jesus, I am... I am encouraged in Jesus. I am strengthened in Jesus. And he will cause you to inherit. Jesus causes me to inherit. Not, any, not the law, not keeping it, not being a good boy. Jesus causes me to inherit. And that's a blessing that we could close with. But I just want to share something more with you before we do. I want to help you see what's going on here with Israel and the big picture that relates to you. Since you're in Jesus and in his family, there's more than you would realize. So if you'd hang on with me a little bit here, I want to share with you really it's what's going on is that there's one war, but it's got two fronts. Now, when we get to Deuteronomy chapter 32, we'll be picking this topic up again, really, as we just go through the text of Deuteronomy. But we tend to just think about the physical so often. Yet, what we're seeing back here in Deuteronomy 2 and 3 and so forth is not only the physical as a call for Abraham's descendants to go and take the land. It's not only that. It is a front on the spiritual realm, on the spiritual forefront as well. And it's a statement that's going on where God is not going to give in to the wicked principalities and powers who are working in the sons of disobedience. He's not going to give in to these wicked principalities and powers and rulers and beings and so forth that are working against God's purposes for this world and for all of mankind. Not only is he not going to give into it, he's going to attack it. Really? Yeah. You see, there's more than meets the eye here. The reasons God has Israel taking out these nations uh, goes beyond his, just his earthly promises for literal dirt. These nations are involved with the purposes of evil divine powers, the gods of this world, the rulers and principalities and heavenly realms. And these nations are, that are involved with it need to be destroyed as well. They're too involved. And they're, they're a conduit by which it's all happening. Okay? We, we just think, oh no, they're spiritual, they're physical. Guys, are you a soul? Do you have a body? You're spiritual and physical. You're real. Every minute you walk, every, everything you do, all that we do is involved. Words we speak out of physical lips. Spiritual, yet you're physical. It, it's just more entwined than we like to think sometimes. I'll just put it that way, okay? Of course, unveiled, whoa, look what I see, sort of thing. You see that in the Bible in places. And throughout the New Testament, I don't have time to go into it, but it talks about rulers of this age. Rulers, 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 rulers. It's talking about this stuff, believe it or not. So when when God divided the nations in Deuteronomy 32, he divided the nations according to these sons of God, okay? And he basically put rulers and principalities in the heavenly realms over authority over nations before Babel and before that rebellion. And yet they, these divine rulers chose to rebel as seen in the Tower of Babel. And God uh, basically, he let these nations go their way, gave them, gave them different tongues so that they would disperse. And he forced a disruption of that unified rule, uh, rage and rebellion against God. It was, a, it was a world rebellion against God is what was going on there. It's what's going to happen in the future too. And they rebelled. So what did he do? He disinherited all of those nations. And he says, okay, I'm going to take one nation. And I'm, I'm going to make my own. I'll be their God. Let's play a game here. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. It's Israel. Amidst the rest of all these hostile nations. So there's hostile spiritual warfare that's going to go on, that is continuing to go on. Hello, look at the news, look at the nations, look at everything. Why do the nations rage? People plot vain things. He's going to hold them in derision. It's going to happen. You should support Israel. But God has a plan for his one nation in the midst of it all. And the battle scene is set. 
So he brings uh, Israel into that land. It's the beginning of a physical, geographical, spiritual confrontation right here. Really, it's just of epic proportions. It's a kingdom battle for world rule. And what's happening with Israel taking out these Amorites and what's going to happen through Joshua and the conquest of the land, it's confronting this rebellion as well. That's what's happening. It's, it's like he strikes at the epicenter of it in a way. Now, Israel isn't going to fulfill it, would they? Israel is going to fall sway to the worship and idolatry of these false gods. Israel is going to fall sway to it. But there's a promise that happens to the line of King David that a Messiah is going to come, and through the Messiah, the kingdom will be established. Not just the kingdom, though, as a Jew might think, over Israel, but over all the nations of the world going way beyond involving his church. Do you not know you will judge angels? It's huge. This is just, it's, it's bigger than we think. And yet, it's, it's all entwined with what you already know, really. And God promises to bring that victory. And so, if you turn quickly to Matthew 16, please. In Matthew 16, Jesus is with his disciples, and we'll pick it up in verse Let's start in verse 13. He came into the region of Caesarea Philippi. So where did he get to when he starts this conversation? Jesus instigates a specific conversation and leads them through specific steps, okay? Do you think Jesus is intentional in all that he says and does? Well, duh. Okay, so Jesus has them in where? Caesarea Philippi. Where Caesarea Philippi? The southeastern base of of Mount, south, sorry, southwestern base of Mount Hermon. Caesarea Philippi is the southwest base of Mount Hermon, okay? And he's got them there at the southwest base of Mount Hermon. And then he says, who do men say that I am? Let's hear a declaration. And they're like, well, this or that. And then who do you say? Verse 16, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. All right. Verse 17, bless you to you, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is his literal rule and reign, his present rule and reign on earth. Okay. Not the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You've you're you got some spiritual authority coming your way. That's what he's telling them, the church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. My spirit's going to be in you. My presence will be with you. And everywhere your church is, that's going to be now the temple, the sacred space, the members of the temple. It's just so cool. Now think about this. Uh, he's at Caesarea Philippi. It's located there, and he says the gates of hell are not going to prevail. And then he commanded in verse 20, his disciples, they don't tell anyone, but be quiet. Don't tell anyone that I'm the Christ. I'm the Messiah bringing this kingdom to earth. Don't tell anyone yet, okay? Uh, okay, verse 21, he began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things, and be killed, raised the third day. And Peter says, you know, that's where the famous things, Lord, no, far be it from you. It shall not happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, verse 23, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. You're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So Jesus says, don't talk about it right now. And he starts telling them, guess what? I'm going to go die on the cross. I'm going to be delivered into their hands. In other words, the kingdom's now, but not yet. It's coming, but not yet. And I'm going to die. And they're like, no way are you going to die. Or bring your kingdom or whatever. And he's like, nope, I'm going to die. This is the plan. And... Jesus had always planned for triumph over the gods of this world, but this is also, this is obviously, this is part of it, what he's doing here. They just don't get it, and it's hard to understand. It's a secret path to to his victory. So in verse 24 to 27, he basically says, hey, if you want to follow me and you want to have victory, you're going to do something that's so contrary. You're not going to take up the physical sword like Peter will do in the future. You're going to, you're going to, take up the sword of the spirit. You know, you're not going to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from God. If you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross. You need to be ready to lose your life. And, and through that, there's going to be a victory for the church. It's just incredible. It's like the church is a light, and someone 
pers- why do you think there's so much persecution, by the way? It's not just a physical, you know, policy game the world's playing or whatever. There's a spiritual oppression and hostility against Jesus' church. Can you- and so when there's persecution on the church, someone puts out a flame. But then embers go flying out everywhere, and it starts a lot more flames. And you can't defeat it. That's, that's like persecution and what's happening to the church. And yet, it's, it is light in darkness. And it's an affront to the darkness. And the darkness will not overcome it, will it? So, um, Jesus is, it's a kingdom battle over world rule. It's, and here is this battle scene where it's been set. Jesus then takes them there because he's the fulfillment of those promises of who will do it. And he says, here's the victory. And right after that, he says, oh, look at verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he will reward each according to his works. That's, just a saying, that's not just saying, live a good life and forgive people and I'll reward you. He's telling him, listen, there's more to it. I'm going to come in the glory of my Father with all the angels. You do it my way. Let's win this battle my way. When you win the battle my way, I'm going to come with the glory of my Father and the angels, and it's going to be supreme uh, rule and a taking over. It's just incredible. And it's like, oh, he says that right there. Interesting. Don't be ashamed of the way he does things. And assuredly, verse 20, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Verse, or chapter 17. You're going to see it in a few days because six days later, he took Peter, James, and John up on a high mountain, Mount Hermon, by themselves, transfigured before them, face shone like the sun, clothes became white as the light, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. And the Lord, it's great to be here, and so on, and this is my beloved son, hear him. And they're afraid. It's just immensely powerful. But verse 9 in chapter 17 Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Now, it's pretty cool that Moses is in the land that he could see from Mount Pisgah, right? That he's there, he's in it. But Jesus is counseling with them. And they're getting, getting to see this. And he's doing it on top of Mount Hermon. And then he tells them, Don't tell anybody this. Why be quiet? He came in a manner that they would not expect. It says in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 to 9, that if he had come in a way that the wicked rulers of this world would have known, they wouldn't have crucified him. In other words, if you knew I was setting you up for your own death blow, say we're playing a game and I was just playing chess with you, and you're like, oh, I'll take that piece too, thanks. Oh, I'll take that piece too, and I let you have my queen? You just let me have your queen? Yeah, I did. But watch this, my next move is checkmate on you, right? And so if they had known, if you had known I was going to play that move on you, you wouldn't have done what you did. If they had known that crucifying the Lord of glory would bring their destruction, they wouldn't have done it. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. They wouldn't have done it. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7 through 9. They would keep, so Jesus says, keep it hidden until I take on this victory. Do you get it now? What's going on here? He's going to deal the death blow to Satan and sin and the wicked divine powers of this world and receive the kingdom to himself. So it's a huge concept. It's big what's going on. But right now is the age of the church. The bride is increasing in in her influence and yet we're being persecuted. and, And yet that persecution is going to grow and continue. It's been the worst several years of persecution the world's seen. And we should expect that. The hostility, the aggression, all of that. And what's our victory? What's our game plan? Be the light. Die to yourself. Share Jesus with boldness. Like, the victory is what he showed us in Matthew 16. The gates of hell won't prevail against the church. And you're not a fool if you give your life. You're not a fool if you share the gospel. And it may look like a temporary losing, but it sure isn't. I mean, look at Psalm 10 that we read earlier. It's like, why are they doing this? They think they're getting away with it. They're not getting away with anything. The Lord is going to return and and deal with it all. And so there's an answer why we're facing such spiritual warfare and persecution, but he's going to return with the glory of the Father and the holy angels. He's going to conquer. Every knee is going to bow. Every knee where? Every knee 
in the heavenly places. All those rulers, they're all going to bow. All those on earth are going to bow, and all those under the earth who've been awaiting that judgment, ultimate judgment, are going to bow to him as well. And what began with Abraham, then here to Israel, strategically, really it was a beachhead. And you know what a beachhead is? Here's a definition. A defended position on a beach taken from the enemy uh, by landing forces from which an attack can be launched. I think what happened in Deuteronomy 3 in taking the kingdom of Bashan was a beachhead. It was a defended, now became a defended position on a beach taken from the enemy by landing forces from which an attack can be launched. I don't know, I could be wrong on that, but it seems to fit. And at least my understanding of what's going on here helps me. And so all this advance on the land God is saying and this destruction of these nations, all you in rebellion, all you hostile nations, you practicing wickedness, you're doing this stuff, divine and earthly, you're done. You're done. Your day is coming and you're done. They're going to be judged and taken out of the way for God's rule, and he's going to dispossess them and all of their rule. And even to the point where Hebrews 1 talks about where Jesus is ashamed to call us his brethren, and we're going to rule over the angels. Because all of their positions that they rebelled as, as heads over that government, they're going to be taken down, and those in the church are going to be re- replacing that. What? Yeah, the human authority is going to surpass those that he did give only those angels in that sense that rebelled, okay? So it's huge. We're his church. And, you know, it's, it's not often that we discuss these things. Uh, there, there is, though, a great spiritual conflict. And if you want to come up, we'll close with a song, Angela. And um, I just want to say that we're more involved with it than we think, though. We think, well, what is this stuff? This doesn't have to do with me or whatever. Yeah, it does. We, we are more involved, you're more involved with it than you think. And I like it because it's, it's, the, game doesn't, the game plan doesn't change. It's just that you're more aware. And those promises to Israel, if they wouldn't turn to left or right, but they walk straight with him, and they obey his word, they have victory. It's the same for us. Don't turn to left or right, obey his word, you have victory. Walk in faith. Faith in his word and what he's, what he's given us, right? But also, he basically told them, no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. You guys, the kingdom of Og and all these other guys, their, their weapons will not prosper. Didn't he tell that to the church? No weapon formed against you will prosper. Yep. No weapon formed against us will prosper, brothers and sisters. It's true. So his kingdom is coming, and we should be expectant that he's going to do great things. Let's uh, stand together.